today as we come to the table. Then you go to the other scene and there's Mary in the living room not helping and she's sitting at Jesus' feet just listening to everything he's saying. And Martha comes in, make her help me. There's dishes to do, there's food. What Lord? And she's really rebuking the Lord and telling him what to do. I mean, she's telling the Lord, you make her help me and you do this and you do that. And you know, Jesus didn't, re he didn't like, you know, light into Martha. He just said, Martha, of the two things here, Mary's doing the best. She's at my feet hearing my word. So what God wants more out of us, yes, we're to be diligent about the things of the Lord, but God would much rather have us loving Him and spending time with Him. Have you ever been busy for the sake of being busy? In the moment, you may feel like you're getting a lot done, but in the end, the only thing you've accomplished is to have been busy. It comes down to a matter of quality over quantity. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary, Knoxville. In today's message, Pastor Mark explains that while being busy and doing for the Lord is good, it isn't as busy as being with the Lord. You may think it's better to do as much as you can in the name of the Lord when in reality, spending time with the Lord, building relationship and learning is really what matters. Now, let's join Pastor Mark in the book of Revelation chapter one with today's edition of Come to the Table. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you've left your first love. Wow. Guys, this is the first century. This letter was written about 40 years after the church was born. One generation into the church being born, the church has already started walking away from its first love. And notice the Lord didn't say you lost your first love. He said you left it. It was a choice over time. Slowly getting out of the word, slowly getting out of prayer, slowly getting out of devotion. Maybe not, I don't need to go, you know, every week or he's saying, you've just kind of let it fade away. You've left it. And I think that God's voice would be here kind of, I think in a, in a real tone of, um, of, of sorrow and remorse. You know, we don't know what God's inflection is. You know, when God sent us, sent us his text message, the message of this text. We don't always know how he said it. You know, we don't know. And I, I got tickled at Tracy. She was trying to make a point with something. She was real excited about something and talking to her phone. Just really getting excited about it. And I'm laughing going, they, they don't know how you're saying that. And I think that's how it was with the Lord. The Lord was, when he, we don't know the inflection he said it in, but knowing the love that he has for us, I bet you when he sent this text message, it was, you've left your first love. Don't you understand? I love you. And you've turned away. What can be more heartbreaking than someone who loves you turning that love away? Probably everyone in here has experienced that, whether it's puppy love as a kid, maybe even all the way up in a marriage relationship. But it's painful. And I think there's a, there's a tone of pain in this when the Lord says, you've left your first love. So what he's saying is, you can be busy about God's work. You can labor to the point of exhaustion, be involved in ministry, do outreaches, do your radio show, do your whatever. But if you're not loving me, what does it mean? I know this from scripture. He would rather have us do less and love him more. I'm not saying we shouldn't be diligent. But if you gave him the choice, Lord, can I be busy from sunrise till sunset for you, just doing busy work, but not be so intimate? Or... Door number two, I could be super duper intimate but not do as much. Which would you choose? Door number two, I would rather you be intimate with me. Remember Mary and Martha? Martha's the busybody here on the house, getting everything done. And it needs to be done. Jesus, I mean, after all, God's coming to dinner. You know, it's bad enough when friends are coming over. You know, 
Girls, get the house clean. Hurry, who's coming? God, you know. <laughs> so I understand Martha's anxiousness. But then you go to the other scene, and there's Mary in the living room not helping, and she's sitting at Jesus' feet just listening to everything he's saying. And Martha comes in, make her help me. There's dishes to do. There's food. What, Lord? And she's really rebuking the Lord and telling him what to do. I mean, she's telling the Lord, you make her help me, and you do this, and you do that. And, you know, Jesus didn't, re he didn't like, you know, light into Martha. He just said, Martha, of the two things here, Mary's doing the best. She's at my feet hearing my word. So what God wants more out of us, yes, we're to be diligent about the things of the Lord, but God would much rather have us loving him and spending time with him than anything else. And he says, you've left your first love. He says, now he gives the remedy, verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Let's talk about it from the church's viewpoint first. He's telling the church, if you don't turn back to being a loving church and loving the people and loving me like you should, I'm going to remove my spirit. Wow. God's not saying they'll all not go to heaven. It's not a salvation issue here. He's saying, it's going to be a dead church. I'm backing out. Here's the bottom line. The Lord says, I will not stay in a loveless church. I won't do it. That's why when you go to a lot of churches, even if their doctrine is right on, you know, and they're serving God in all these ways, but it just kind of feels dead. Probably it's because there's no love there like there should be. And the Lord says, if it's loveless, after a while, I'm going to back off from that. Because love is who I am. And love is what I want you showing first and foremost to each other and to the world around you. And so he says, if you don't do that, I'm backing off. That would be a scary message for me to hear as a pastor. I can tell you that. But notice here, guys, I don't want to go on without pointing this out briefly. Notice what he says. If you're in that place where you feel like you've left your first love, here's the remedy. Remember, repent, redo. Those three things. Remember what it used to be like when you were truly going for it in the Lord. Do you remember? Your Bible went with you everywhere. You couldn't wait to be with the Lord, reading the word, praying, whatever, worshiping. You just, I mean, anytime the doors of the church were open, you were there. You remember that? He says, all right, now you remember, good. Now repent. Repent of not doing that and start doing it again. And I'm not laying a trip on you to be here every time the doors are open. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm making a point. Repent and do whatever you need to do to get back to that first love. And then what do he say? Do the first works. Redo. Do the first works again. Get back in the Word. Get back in prayer. Start serving again. Be a part of the things of God. That's the remedy. Remember, repent, and redo. He says, but this you have. And now he goes back to something else good. Again, I love it. He starts out good. He gives them a nevertheless. Then he encourages them at the end. Again, kind of a nice little encouragement counseling sandwich. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, we can't be 100% sure who the Nicolaitans were. There's different theories out there. I'm going to just share with you the meanings of the word. Nico means to rule over, and laetans is where we get the word laity. So many believe what he's saying is, I hate church hierarchy. Don't get me wrong, there has to be structure. Elders, pastor, structure. Got the words clear on that. But what he hates is, I believe what he's talking about, is when church leaders rule over the people like they are greater and better. You bow to me. You kiss my ring. God hates that. He hates it. It's the deeds of those who rule over the laity, the Nicolaitans. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So you'll be in the kingdom with the Lord, eating, and by the way, the tree of life, they'll be all over the garden. When the Lord comes back, there'll be more than one tree of life that'll be lining uh, the streets there, and that's a whole other prophecy, but you'll be eating that. Now he comes to the next church, the persecuted church. This is the one, uh, Smyrna, that goes from 2nd century to 4th century. He says, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna write this, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. Now notice he uses the identifier of dying and coming to life with them. Why? Because church history tells us some six million Christians were killed during this time. This was during the time of Caesar worship. And the Caesars demanded to be worshipped as God. So every year, every citizen of Rome had to go and pinch incense, drop it on an altar, and say, Caesar is Lord. And if you did that, they gave you a certificate that said, all right, 
You complied with the government. There's your certificate. You take it home. And if the authorities came to your door and said, have you de declared Caesar as Lord? Here's my certificate. Okay, all right. And they move on. But if you didn't, they would arrest you. And if you wouldn't declare Caesar as Lord, they'd either throw you in jail or kill you. And so during this time, what are the Christians going to do? What if all of a sudden they came to us and said, you've got to say Obama is God? I'm putting this in modern day language. Just bear with me. That won't happen. But what if they did? And if, how many of us could do that? We couldn't do that. And if you didn't do it, they killed you. That's what the church of Smyrna, which by the way, Smyrna, it deals with uh, um, you know, death. And, um, and so this whole death of the, the first and the last, I was about to say that I think it's the root word of myrrh. I'll go ahead and tell you why I paused there, but I want to back that up because I don't remember off the top of my head. And um, again, I didn't do an in-depth word study, so I want to be careful on that. But either way, he is speaking about uh, this is the suffering church. They were dead. They came back to life. Why would he use that imagery? Because... He wants to give them hope. A lot of you are going to die. You're going to die for your faith. But you know what? You're going to resurrect. This isn't the end. It's just the beginning. So he uses this encouragement introduction here. He says, I know your works, your tribulation, that is the, the oppression coming in from the government, and your poverty, but you're rich. Why? Because you're rich in the things of God. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but they're a synagogue of Satan. A lot of the Jews declared they were believers, but they didn't believe in Jesus, so they were unsaved, and they would, they would harass the Christians. They would turn the Christians into the Roman government. And he says, they're a synagogue of Satan. They're not really of me. They're of no part of me, he's saying. And again, in church history, that was happening again in this church literally, but in church history, this is what happened. The Jews did this in the 2nd and 4th century, 2nd to 4th. He says, do not fear any of these things which you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Notice it's Satan behind it, that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation for 10 days. Now, probably there was some, there's a, maybe a, a, no doubt a literal aspect here, but again, 10 is the number of trial. It's the number of testing in Scripture as well. It's linked with some other numbers of that, but it's a number of, of hardship or testing. So what he's saying is you're going to be entering into a time of testing and difficulty. So what? Be faithful until death. Who's talking to him? The one who said he was dead and alive. You be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. You'll resurrect as well, and you'll be with me. You can do this. I'll give you the grace to do it. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. A couple things. Notice he keeps saying, he who has an ear, let him hear. That is, we all have ears, but he means in the Spirit. If you're open to hear what God's saying, you're going to hear the voice of God in this. He says, if you're not, you won't. But also notice he says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. What is the second death? That is eternal judgment. The first death is when we die in these bodies. The second death is judgment day, eternal separation from God. He says, if you overcome and you stay true to me, you'll never experience eternal separation from me, but you'll be with me in the kingdom of God. Now we come to the compromising church, the church of Pergamos, 4th and 5th centuries. This is under Constantine. And why were they a compromising church? Constantine made Christianity the legal religion of, of the world, so to speak. And so you had a lot of people, because they wanted to get along with the rest of the world, became fake Christians. Imagine it this way. If the insurance agent wants to sell more insurance at church, pretend you're a Christian or Pretend whatever, you know, you, you, you pretend you're this thing or whoever you are because then you have more sales or you have more whatever. And this is what it developed. Everybody wanted to be a part of the in crowd, so they all pretended to be Christians. And since they weren't really Christians, the church became very watered down and became a very compromising church during the 4th and 5th centuries as Constantine headed it down that road. And so now the Lord deals with, again, another literal church. And again, remember, all these literal churches had these literal problems. But again, historically, in this particular era, we see this is exactly what happened in the days of Constantine. He says, to the angel of the church of Pergamos, write this. These things, says he who was, or rather who has the sharp two-edged sword. There it is, the word of God that cuts both ways, so to speak. That is, I don't put up with compromise. I say it like it is, and what I say I mean. The word of God is where you're to stand. Don't water anything down. Don't go along with the world. Stop it. And so that's why he uses this imagery. He says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. Wow, how would you like to live in a place where God says that's where Satan's throne is? You know, Satan can't be everywhere at one time. He literally is in one place right now. We don't know where that is. But he's in one place right now. Now, the demons he spreads out around the globe, they're everywhere, and they work for him. 
But God is everywhere at one time. Satan can only be in one place. And whether or not this was temporary or a regular visiting spot and stop where Satan kept a throne, we can't be certain. But he says, you're in a place where Satan's throne is. So God is acknowledging this is a tough place you live. It's hard to be a Christian here in Pergamos. I recognize that. And it's very watered down and it's very compromising. He says, and you hold fast to my name and you do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas, my faithful martyr, was killed among you where Satan dwells. Now, we don't know much about Antipas um, and, and what that story was, but obviously a famous believer in their day, the church knew about them, and he was killed there, no doubt making a stand for his faith in Christ in this compromising Satan-enthroned city. He says, but I have a few things against you. So he names a few good things. Remember, they start out that way. Now he gets into the problems. I have a few things against you because you have those there who hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. He says, you've got guys there that are teaching that God's all about money and and, and saying that it's okay to be sexual and you'll be okay with God. Remember Balaam and Balak. Just briefly, Balak hired Balaam to come and curse the children of Israel. And he wasn't able to curse them because God said, I'm not going to let you curse them because they're, they're God's chosen people. So Balaam said, all right, Balak, here's the deal. I can't curse them, but I can tell you how they can curse themselves. You go down there and have the women go among them and get sexual with them and corrupt them sexually, corrupt them morally, and then God will judge them. They'll bring judgment on themselves. At the same time, there were those that were in the church teaching that, saying apparently in this church here, in the compromising church, they were saying, what's the big deal about living together? What's the big deal about, about, you know, whatever? What's the big deal about sex? It's not that big of a deal. Don't be so uptight about it. Everybody's doing it. We don't have to be married. We love each other anyway, and after all, that's just a piece of paper. There were people like that teaching in the church. And God's rebuking that, saying that's sin. Don't put up with it. Stop it. It's the doctrine of of those who say that sexual immorality is okay. And also he says don't put up with those who try to get money from the church, who make money about everything. They always want money. He says it's a stumbling block for the body of Christ. And again, we see all the faith teachers even today. So we see elements of these churches in the modern church today. Those that are teaching sexual immorality, those that are teaching that, you know, that it's no big deal to, you know, even agreeing with the same-sex marriage thing. And then those that are saying, you know what, faith, God wants everybody rich. He wants everybody healthy and wealthy. They had the same problems. He says, you got to stop this. This is wrong. Thus, verse 15, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. God says this more than once. I I hate that. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And again, the two-edged sword is the sword of his mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. That is, I will show you things in Scripture that other people don't see. I'll give you intimate treasures if you will do this, if you'll repent and draw close to me. I'll open your eyes to things. This is a neat promise. And I will also give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. The white stones represented something good. The bad stones in that day represented something bad. He says, I'll give you a white stone. I'll show that you're with me, that you're doing well. I'll reveal secret things to you that I don't reveal to other people. And I'll even give you a new name that no one knows except the Lord. And you'll know it one day. You know, I believe that all of us who follow the Lord have a new name. I don't know what that new name is. You know, he renamed his disciples. Instead of Simon, you're now, you know, Peter. And so he gave him a new name because he was being faithful. Now we come to the corrupt church. This is the church of Thyatira. This again was from century 6 to the 15th century in what we call the the Dark Ages. I I think that no one would doubt that this was a very corrupt time in church history. Um, As we look at the atrocities historically of the Catholic Church during this time. But let me say this too. We don't have to defend church history, guys. We don't have to defend church history. Church history is ugly. So if somebody ever tries to corner you and go, yeah, well, the church did this, and look what happened in the 15th century and 16th, and look what they did, and they tortured people to death. Just agree with them and go, it's horrible, and I'm ashamed of it. What? I'm not going to defend the church. The church blew it bad. The church was completely in sin, totally off course, totally living by the flesh, and even being led by Satan. And this is what the Lord's going to address here. So don't feel like you have to defend it. Just say, yep, that's exactly what happened. But but I'm not going to do that. And I'm ashamed of it, but I can't change it. To the angel of the church of Thyatira, write this. These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Remember what those two represented? God's judgment. He says, 
Thyatira, I'm looking at you in judgment. You, you need to repent. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. That is, you do a lot of good works. You're a very service-oriented movement. You put emphasis on faith, and, you, and you're very patient in all the rituals that you do. As for your works, the last are more than the first. I mean, you're in church every day of the week, some of you. And, and you're doing all these things. Um, in the history of, of the Roman Catholic Church again. And he says, I know you're doing these things. Don't worry, he'll get to the Protestants and beat us up next. So if you're upset that I'm saying anything about Catholics, don't, don't worry, I'm about to hit us in the next church. Or the last one anyway. He says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Again, what he's saying is, is you're allowing a false hierarchy. Is you're allowing people that shouldn't be teaching to teach and you're getting into idolatry. You're, you're worshiping idols. You know, even still today, in the Roman Catholic Church, they'll say, well, these, this statue of Jesus and Mary, this is not, I'm not worshiping them. They just represent Jesus. They represent Mary. That's what an idol is. An idol is something that represents the true thing. He says, you're doing these things. It's not good. He says, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. You know, a lot of Catholics believe, and again, I'm not trying to pick on it. I'm just making a point. We lived in Santa Fe for a while, and uh, most everyone there was Catholic. And they would do whatever they wanted through the week, whatever. It didn't matter. You could sin like crazy as long as you showed up and confessed it, you know, by the weekend. And then you were good to go for another week of heavy-duty sin. I'm not saying they all do that. Please don't misunderstand me. I know better than that. There are saved Catholics, and there are some Catholics that have honored God and loved him. But as a church movement, this was a problem during the 15th or rather the 6th to the 15th century in the Catholic Church. She didn't repent. He says, indeed, I'll cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. That is, they won't be raptured. They'll be here for the tribulation, the great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts and gives to each one according to their works. Now to you I say, and to the rest of Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have until I come. So hold fast. If you're being faithful to God, don't let go of what you have. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. That is, remember Jesus said, we'll rule and reign with him. And now he talks about that. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel. Speaking of a, a prophecy that's pulled out about when we're ruling and reigning with Jesus in the millennial kingdom. He says, as I also have received from my father. So you'll have that even as I have received it from my father. And I will give to him the morning star. Jesus in scripture is defined as the morning star. So you'll have me, and you'll be ruling with me. Verse 29, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The book of Revelation is a good reminder that things happening here on earth have an expiration date. There isn't an indefinite amount of time for evil to persist. If you're honest, you'd likely admit it would be nice to have a reset, a clean slate, a new world of sorts. Well, did you know that Jesus is bringing this about sometime in the future? What a thing to look forward to. Like any blockbuster, end-of-the-world movie, there's always some culmination between good and evil. But guess what? The things mentioned in Revelation will happen. They're not just some made-up plot line to make lots of money at the box office. So keep grounded in the book of Revelation as we uncover more and more of God's heart behind all that will occur. Pastor Mark will continue next time in the book of Revelation. But before we go, we'd like you to know about a way that you can join us this weekend. At Calvary Knoxville, we have several services. We meet on Saturdays at 6 p.m. and Sundays at 9.30 and 11.15 a.m. We also have a midweek service at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings. Come join us and be part of what's going on here. Find out more at thewaymedia.net. You can also give our church office a call at 865-609-1385. Again, that phone number is 865-609-1385. Thanks for being a part of our listening audience. If you'd like to hear these messages whenever you'd like, 
download the Way Media app. We hope you'll continue with us next time in the book of Revelation here on Come to the Table. Come to the Table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville.